Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about the Lebesgue integral of simple functions. And just as a review, um, we're on a measure space. Actually, let me zoom this out a bit. Um, we're on a measure space, x sigma mu, where our x is the real line, sigma is the Borel sigma algebra on the real line, and our measure m is the Lebesgue measure that we defined previously. So just as a review, the Borel sigma algebra is the sigma algebra generated by the open subsets of the real line. And so it turns out that, if you remember the bare category theorem, if A is open, then it can be written as a countable union of open intervals in the real line. So, it's also the sigma algebra generated by the set of open intervals on the real line. Because you can write um, a closed interval as a, an intersection of open intervals, then it's the same as taking closed intervals or half open intervals on the, over the entire... Um, from negative infinity to A and A to infinity, and also I can make that half closed as well. So if this is uh, totally new to you, um, go ahead and review um, the, our, our previous um, video on, on uh, this, or, or um, read, uh, what is it, uh, Gerald, Gerald Falland. I forget the name of it. It's either real analysis or measure theory, one of the two. I can't remember. He defines this set in, in chapter one. Um, so review that. This is kind of a, a somewhat of a dense topic if you're not familiar with it. So this can take some time to absorb. So also don't worry too much about it if, if, uh, if, it, if it doesn't click on the first time. So now I'm ready to define what is called a simple function. We say that f, a function f, and I forgot to mention in the last video, when we talk about Lebesgue integration, at least for now, we're talking about uh, non-negative functions. So we have to map into the non-negative reals for now. And then at the end, we're, uh, we'll get into, well, what if I map into negative numbers? So a function is simple if and only if, in short, its range is finite. So there exists a finite set of numbers that are ordered and a finite number of measurable sets in the Borel sigma algebra that are disjoint. We can assume that without loss of generality. So, um, such that F is a linear combination of indicator functions on that set. So this basically implicitly tells you that the range is finite because uh, I have finitely many sets and I can only take on values alpha n. Why? Because the indicator function, if you haven't seen this definition before, so you draw one because it's, uh, it's one where it, when you're in this set and zero otherwise. So for any set a, that is what the indicator function looks like. It's one when x is in a and it's zero otherwise. And note also, this is just a remark. We could also, so notice that I said that alpha is less than or is greater than or equal to zero. I could have also said that alpha is greater than zero uh, because implicitly, uh, let's say you wanted to include, say, an alpha sub zero in there. Well, then for any x in the complement of this of the union of all those sets, well, it's equal to zero. So you could draw, you could write it as zero times indicator of, uh, of E zero, where E zero is equal to this as well. So just as a remark, whatever definition you prefer is, is fine. They're equivalent definitions. So just as an example of what a simple function looks like. So I remember I said that it's basically like saying that it's a uh, range is finite and uh, uh, it's constant on measurable sets. 
So this is an example. So we're zero on this set here. So if you prefer, let's let's write a zero or e zero equals negative infinity to negative two union two to infinity. And I'm gonna write alpha zero equals zero. So I'm equal to zero on E zero here. Similarly, if I look at where the function's equal to one, well, it's equal to one here and here. So I'm gonna declare E one to be negative two to negative, oh, sorry, this is a closed two. That's closed and that one's open. So this is negative two to negative, both of those are open and three halves open and two closed. And alpha one is equal to one because the function's equal to one at that point. Now let's go to two here. It's equal to two here and nowhere else on this interval. So E two is negative one to zero open and alpha two is two. And finally, it's equal to three on this set. So, oh, sorry, I forgot a section where it's equal to zero. I forgot this section. It's equal to zero here also. So this is a uh, union zero to one open, alpha zero is zero. Al uh, E3 is one to three halves closed alpha three equals three. So notice, you can check me on this. E zero, oh well. E I intersect E J is empty for I not equal to J. Uh, in case I made any mistakes, if that's not true, uh, then I made a mistake and this needs to be modified. And we have that f of x is alpha zero e zero plus, oh, not e zero. Let's just, i equals zero to three of alpha i indicator function of e i. So that's what a typical, um, what a typical, uh, what a typical um, simple function looks like. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this, that way we see it. So the question is, what should the integral of this function be? Um, so it should certainly agree with the Riemann, is it, oh, yeah, yeah, this, uh, I copied everything. So um, certainly its integral should be the same as the Riemann integral, because this function is actually also Riemann integrable is a finite number of discontinuities, right? And so what I'm gonna do is define, um, but remember, in general, simple functions are not Riemann integrable because the Dirichlet function is simple, right? E one, oh, let's do E zero again. E zero is Q complement, it's a measurable set. Alpha zero is zero. E one is Q. Alpha one is uh, one. Also notice, okay, so notice also in this definition, I ordered the alphas 
Um, but when you do this, you don't technically have to do that because it's a finite, right? If I called alpha one, two and alpha one, one, um, then all I'd have to do is relabel everything, right? It's a there exists statement. So, uh, if you ever flip the order, it's not actually important how you label them per se. It's, it's just to simplify visualizing it in the definition. Uh, so you could also say alpha one through alpha n are distinct would be an equivalent definition as well. So, uh, yeah, so pick, pick these and, and that shows you that this, but this is not Riemann integrable. So we have to be smart here. We have to define it differently. And as I mentioned in the previous video, uh, we're going to do exactly, um, what I suggested we would do in the, with the Dirichlet function. So for this particular set, uh, for this particular function, let's go back through the logic. I know that there's finitely many points here. So what I'm gonna do is for each alpha, I'm gonna take the measure of the set where it equals that alpha. In this particular case, zero. So I'm going to take, I'm going to compute the measure of E zero. So that is this set, which is the measure of negative infinity to two closed union two to infinity, which is infinite. Okay. I'm going to take the measure of E1, which is 1. The measure of E2 is um, E2. Oh, sorry. Measure of E1 is uh, 3 halves. All right, so look here. That measures 1 plus 1 half. Similarly here, E2. That measure is 1. And finally, E3. Is 1 half. Okay. And now, all I'm going to do, remember, is... So, I'm considering the pre-image of this set. That is... Right, it's the that's the pre-image is really this set is how I'm getting that. So for each point I go down, I check it, that point is certainly within the set. That point is in the set. That point is in the set. So it's really this set here, down here, but then multiplied by its height. So I get the exact area here. This is what's this is why it's so neat is that you get you get these exact um, right if this if this was with one but I can disconnect this since on each level I'm literally taking the preimage down to an infinitesimal point I can disconnect these things and it and it's still a natural formulation so that will give me the area if I take the measure of the preimage this is the preimage. Multiply it by its height, that gives me the area of that rectangle. And I get the exact contribution from there. So that's why we want to ignore negative values for, for now. Uh, it's because we don't want to just, we don't want to deal with negative areas. It's, it's just, uh, it's easier to formulate it that way. So I'm going to say that the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of x dx is the sum n equals zero to three of alpha n times the measure of the pre-image of E n. That is, that is the definition. This is equal to zero, okay, times infinity plus one times three halves plus uh, two times one plus three times one half, okay? And this term is probably bothering you. 
what is zero times infinity? So zero times infinity is defined as zero. Because remember that measures map infinity is, is an allowed value. Zero times infinity is defined as zero. And this definition makes sense because, well, this function's zero everywhere, right? The reason is because zero times x, or let's, uh, let's look at it this way. The limit as x goes to infinity of zero times x is zero. So zero times infinity should be zero in that sense. So that is zero. This is zero plus three halves plus two plus three halves, which is three plus three plus two. Or no, no, it's three plus two is five. And you can calculate it. So we'll finish this video by defining it in general. Sorry, I was doing something earlier over here. Um, so I'm not going to redeclare the ENs are disjoint and so on, right? And I'm going to do the integral over R, okay, because uh, we're going to have wacky sets here. So um, rather than splitting things up, you know, neg I could write negative infinity to infinity, but um, I want to get you guys used to this notation. This is the definition of the integral of a simple function, alpha n. Ah, sorry. Measure of e n. And note also previously, I now realize that I wrote this. So I wrote earlier the pre-image of this singleton. That's because this en is the pre-image of, of that set, is the point. So where are we going with this? Well, now if f is not simple, I'm going to say that it's the supremum of the integral over g dx. So anytime you don't see the r down here, we're always talking about definite integrals here. Okay, so if you don't see the R, that means over the whole space. Okay, so we're going to take a sequence of simple functions that are less than it, and then we're going to take a supremum of it. And that will define our Lebesgue integral. So now the question is, for all f, does there exist g simple, gn simple, with gn converging to f? So we need this to be true, okay, for that definition to make sense. And it turns out that this is true, which is what we'll prove in the next video. So uh, thank you guys for watching, uh, and I hope to see you in the, in the next video where we'll prove this property.